Hello, I've been held up in my house a lot lately with my injured ankle. I'm finally able to be a little bit more mobile and I miss being outside. So I figured I would go on a hunt for fall. At this point in the season, I doubt I'm gonna find much, but I'm gonna walk through these woods and see if I can find some fall while we talk about what I read in September. So I'm gonna start out by giving a little update on how I've been thinking about reviewing lately. It's, it'll be quick, it's not a big deal. It won't interest everybody, so there's a timestamp time stamp to skip straight to the books if you want that. But pretty much since I started my channel, the way I've viewed reviewing has been very much like reviewing is, or rather a person's experience with a book is very subjective, it's very personal, and so my goal is just to talk to you about books and give you my subjective experience, because that's literally all I can do. Uh, but I also try to be really intentional about my reading and about how I talk about books so that you can get something out of it too, so that you can uh, hopefully come out of the review with my subjective experience, but also maybe knowing concretely what the book is supposed to be about, what it's trying to do, maybe some ideas of what it does well or didn't work for me so that you can walk away knowing if you want to look into the book more or not. My problem is that sometimes I just don't have a lot to say about a book. <laughs> sometimes I finish a book, it didn't do much for me, and I can give you the synopsis of it, but I really don't have a lot to say. And for me, it's just not really all that fun to talk about books that affect me that way. Like I want to have a discussion. I want to chat with you about some stories, but if a story just isn't, it didn't latch on to me, it didn't do much for me, then I don't really want to talk about it. So uh, I have decided that I, there will be some books that I don't talk about. It's not a big deal. You probably won't even notice if you're on my Discord and you see me reading something and then I don't talk about it in a vlog or in a wrap up, then you'll know. But just every now and then there's a book that I'm just like, eh, I don't have enough to say about that to talk about it. And so then I won't. But also with wrap ups, uh, uh, since I started my review channel, which is always linked in the, in the description if you don't, if you haven't checked it out yet, I do weekly reading vlogs giving you updates on what I've been reading as well as spoiler discussions for some of my favorite books. Um, since I started doing the review channel, I've treated wrap-ups sort of as just bullet point, here's a quick glimpse at what I read, and then there's other videos where you can get more information on them. That too is pretty unsatisfying. I just want to talk about books. So uh, wrap-ups will be dedicated. I'm chatting about these books. I'm going into them, which means that maybe if you're, if you follow me closely, some of the discussions will be a little bit repetitive if you've already seen the vlog for it, but thems is the ways. <laughs> so the first book that we're going to talk about that I read this month is Blood Over Bright Haven. So this is by M.L. Wang, the author who wrote Sort of Kaigen. I loved this book. I loved this book so much, but I do think that this is going to be a book that has a little bit more mixed reviews than, or will hit people a little bit, maybe some people are going to love it, some people are going to not love it so much. Probably a little bit more polarizing. <laughs> took me forever to find that word. This book's probably going to be a little bit more polarizing than sort of Kaigen was, or at least I, I think it might be. And let me tell you why. So our main character is Siona. She, oh shucks, I read this at the beginning of the month and I don't have cell phone reception where I am, so I can't look up. Is it a high mage that she wants to be? I'll put it on the screen in case I've forgotten exactly, but she, she wants to, she has a scholarly pursuit. She wants to be accepted within the ranks of this scholarly practice and study of their magic system, because the magic system in this book is very technical. It's very sciencey. It's very alchemy-esque. I mean, there is alchemy in it, um, but it's also, it's very measured. So it's, it's mathematic. You have to think through the equation of using the magic in this world. So if you're moving an object that's light, it'll take a different equation than moving an object that's heavy. That's a very simple explanation of it. Um, so it's very precise and there's very, very little margin for error. So those that pursue a more technical training and study of this magic system are in this institute. So she's trying to be a part of this. She's very gifted. She's very intelligent, but this is a man's world. <laughs> this is a man's system. And so once every 10 years, women are allowed to, uh, a woman is allowed to test for this, uh, and then that's it. So Siona 
has she gets to test for it she gets to try to be accepted into i think it's called a mage scholar she gets she gets to test to be a part of the scholarly pursuit and uh in the beginning of the book, it's, hey, Sayona, don't worry about it, because if you fail, all women fail. So, like, it's fine. You're just, you're just another one. There's no pressure. And she's like, no, all the pressure in the world. Because if I fail, then I'm proof. I'm, I'm the proof of this rule that, yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we don't need to be testing women. Uh, and if I fail, then that's 10 more years before, that's 10 more years of other women not getting an opportunity because I got the opportunity and I missed it. So it's like this high pressure, really examining um, how she just doesn't have the same chances in this world that her male co counterparts do. But at the same time, there's also this cultural structure that's happening where there's these um, queen, I think they're, Quinn, Quinn, again, sorry. I read this at the beginning of the month, so some of the terms are, are fuzzy in my brain. Uh, but there's this people group, there's this race, that basically because of the beliefs of the society, um, <laughs> the indoctrination of the society, um, it's believed that they're destined for work. They're destined for low wages, manual labor, you're cursed, this is your life, this is your lot in life. And Siona perpetuates those ideals very much. She doesn't challenge them, she doesn't understand that, uh, she basically can't see past her nose. She's she's facing all of this discrimination, but then she's also dishing out plenty, dis uh, pl plenty of discrimination in another way and that's all intentional so um wang will intentionally be uh having very blunt conversations very blunt dialogue where a character will use a lot of verbiage that's very familiar to us because she's making a point and because of that a lot of this book is sitting in rooms talking a lot of this book is uh sitting around and studying this magic, trying to solve the equations, trying to figure out how to use this magic system more aptly. Um, Siona is paired up with uh, Tamil, who is a Quinn. He's of this race, and she's partnered with him. He's her lab assistant as uh, as an insult. You know, we don't want a woman on our team, so here you can have the janitor, and she accepts it as an insult, agrees that it's an insult, but rolls with it. Uh, and she learns a lot about him and his culture and all, all of that that comes with it. But it's also really, even though it's very slow and it's very introspective, it's also there's very visceral seeds. Like when we see, when we start to uncover more of the uh, seedy undergrounds of the society and the way it works and we see some of the magic in action, it's, it's intense. So anyway, I think that, uh, personally love 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 to this book I think that it was it was such an introspective book that it really drew me in close and I enjoy a good slow story so the pacing didn't bother me in the slightest I was very invested in finding out the mysteries of what's going on um, but I do think that it will be a little bit more it could potentially be a little bit more divisive because since it's such an introspective story since Wang had certain intentions with it uh, the plot was not <laughs> the plot was very predictable there's a lot of things that you could call as far as oh, okay this means that and that's going to go in that direction and it does and it all does and in an article that ML Wang wrote, uh, or rather a blog post, she explained that she wrote the story first, and it was initially a novella, and then she expanded on it, and in editing learned, well, she was told that she really needed to build the atmosphere because there really wasn't much world that she had started with. And I think that you can see that. I think you can kind of tell that the atmosphere was tacked on because it wasn't as vivid. It wasn't as, um, the world wasn't and the setting wasn't as crucial to the story or as impactful to the story as it was in sort of Kaigen. Anyway, I could just see it working for some people and not working for others. Personally, I loved it. I love the questions it asked. I love the ideals that it challenged. I really enjoyed uh, Tamil. Tamil's such a great character. Oh my goodness. And the magic, again, so technical, so precise, and so there were some really disturbing scenes that were really well done. 
personally, I loved this book. Next, I have two quick reviews because they're both for sequels in series. So Summer Night is book four in the Dresden Files. So he works as a private detective, and when some supernatural death happens, call Harry. He shows up to investigate the crime. So it's like noir, but vampires, or noir, but ghosts. In this one, it's noir but fairies. So we're dealing with magical fae, we're dealing with curses and bargains. They can't tell a lie, but they sure do know how to talk around the truth, kind of shenanigans. Oh no, don't start raining again. Something I really like about Dresden is that it doesn't matter what kind of creature you're talking about, it's not just like, okay, fairies, here's your fairies. It's, there's different types, like there's the summer court, there's the, well, well, I guess that's kind of normal with fairies. There's a lot of different layers to how they function and what their inner politics are, but also in this book, the world really opened up a lot. Things started connecting a ton that have been laid, uh, the groundwork has been laid a long time ago, and, characters that either have not been a part of the story but have been hinted that they're coming or characters that have been an active part of the story and now have to take a back seat because of consequences of previous books just a lot going on and then there's harry himself who daggum just can't catch a break <laughs> He really tries, man. With all of his might, he tries, but this world is not kind to him or the people he loves, and he he really tries to do his best for everyone around him, sacrificing himself for those he loves, but cannot catch a break. And also, I just need him to go a little bit a little bit less hard on himself. I just I want him to be a little bit more forgiving towards himself. So I'm, anyway, a lot of expansion of the story in this, as well as a lot of expansion of Harry, or rather, I just feel like I'm getting to know him better. A lot of depth, but still your, your standard, sir, that's inappropriate. Like, like when he's talking to a magical, everlasting, eternal fae, and she's like, I will not forget this offense. And he's like, I probably will. Happens to me all the time. Like, She's much more powerful than you. The audacity. <laughs> you can't talk to her like that. Anyway, this is still not my favorite Dresden. It's still book three. I loved book three, but this did expand the world a lot and it has me excited to see what's to come. Sorcery is book six, I think, if you're reading chronologically, which I am, but book three in the Rincewin Chronicles. Rincewin is such a fun char character to follow because he too is a wizard and it's his destiny and it's calling and it's who, it's who he wants to be. It's the essence of who he is. But also when danger comes, he would like to run in the opposite direction, please. <laughs> I mean, not that he's unwilling to be heroic, he absolutely is, and he's willing to risk his own safety for others if he has to, <laughs> but his first instinct is gonna be to run. So a lot of his books, there's a lot of comedy that comes with him just not, not being up to the task. Like he would just really like to live a boring life, please and thank you, and why, why does adventure keep chasing him? Could it stop? So the lore of this world is the eighth son of an eighth son. Congratulations, you're a wizard. Um, but what happens when that eighth son has another eight sons? What happens to that eighth son? Well, he's a sorcerer. We don't like that because those guys are real powerful. And a lot of times devastation comes their way. But we got one. And uh, that's that's kind of the the instigator of this particular adventure and we have Rincewind but we also have a thief that is a thief by family heritage not necessarily by choice we have a barbarian who's only been a barbarian for three days but he's he's trying real hard we have a talking hat and then we of course have the sorcerer as well all the Discworld books I think uh you know they're hilarious Discworld is some of the funniest stuff that I've read. But also, you know, some of the some of the humor doesn't it doesn't always age perfectly and I think probably sorcery had some of the the m more of that than I'm typically used to. And just generally I I like Rincewind books, but they're not my favorite ones. So sorcery, both of these were great additions, but neither one was my favorite of their respective series. I did read I Want to Eat Your Pancreas, uh, which is a manga bind up. The whole thing, whole story is right here. This follows two characters, Sakura, right there, that's her, and then he isn't named until later in the story. So we start off by finding, by hearing, by learning that she's going to die by the end of the story and he's going to be big sad. So um, right off the bat, we know what we're getting into. And then after we get that initial 
beginning, then we back up to them meeting, developing a friendship, and learning and growing from one another. So Sakura has this terminal illness and she has, she has a, a date. Uh, you have about one year to live. And her focus is on, okay, I've got a year. Let's make it count. I want to live life to the fullest. I want to have the experiences I want to have. And I, I want my life to be something that was worth living, even if it was shorter than I thought it was going to be. And they learn a lot from each other. They grow a lot as individuals and they develop a really strong bond over this time and we know what's coming but the way it's written it kind of lulls you into not forgetting that it's coming but just getting used to the day to day and then it and then it says something and you're like oh, that was the signal oh no it's time so the impact is still there even though you were warned what was to come but so the story itself was really sweet and very charming and there was a lot uh a lot of really great lines and a lot of really great uh thoughts especially from sakura on how valuable her life was even though it was shorter but something that i really loved about it is the narrative structure was it, it was a parallel to what sakura's story was. For her, it was important that her life was still worth living even though it was short. It was still valuable. It still held impact even if it didn't get to be as long as she wanted it to be. Just the same. Even though this book, even though we knew what was coming, we knew the end was near, it still held the impact. It still had a purpose and a point and held meaning. And I really liked that parallel between her choosing to uh, view her life that way and then us being able to see the story in that way. Like it still had all the impact that it needed to without having to jump us with the surprise. Anyway, like I said, this is the whole story right here. So do recommend, it's a very quick read and I enjoyed it a lot. I also started, uh, I've read the first four volumes of Two Year Eternity and the first seven volumes of Dragon Ball Z, but neither one of those are completed this month, so I'll talk to you about them next month. Then I blitzed through the Shattered Sea trilogy. This was an impulse read. It was not on my TBR. It was not what I was planning to read, but uh, we, d we made this bingo card on my Patreon for us to try to get bingo based off of books that we read by the end of the year, and one of them was to uh, finish something that you had DNF and I was looking for I was looking through my shelves and I was like what have I tried and not completed plenty of things but then I saw half a king and I was like oh my gosh I have Abercrombie that I haven't read what's wrong with me so I read it I think in two days loved it it was so fun I mean it wasn't amazing but it was so fun I think I gave it like 3.5 stars and then just went through the next two back to back to back it was just fun. It's been a while since I've read Abercrombie. He's one of my all-time favorite authors, if not my favorite author. And it was just really nice to be back to his writing. So this is a YA trilogy. Uh, the first book follows Yarvis? Yarville? Yarvi. Prince Yarvi, who is born with a disability and this kingdom, this, uh, this setting this world views him as lesser because of it so he isn't going to he's not really in line to inherit the throne until his father and his brother are killed and then all of a sudden it's thrust on him and it's not what he wanted but he still makes the promise that he's going to take the throne he's going to do his best and he's going to try to find who did this to his family and get revenge on them <laughs> but then he too meets an ill fate. He doesn't die, but things don't go well for him. He too gets usurped out of the throne. And then it becomes, all right, fine, I'm getting my throne back. And he has to go through a journey to try to get there. And it's very unpredictable because it's Abercrombie. And I just, it was, it was a lot of fun. Then I read book two, Half the World, which follows Thorn and Brand. Thorn is a natural very skilled fighter, but she's also a woman, can't be having that. So she kind of gets sabotaged a little bit, a lot of it, and uh, knocked out of the running for that. And Brand is an excellent fighter, but has too big of a moral compass. So he's also out. So then they team up with Yarvi in his new position in his, in his uh, several years later. 
and they're traveling half the world to try to uh, do an uprising against the, the high king and form an alliance against him. They're trying to gain allyship with other kingdoms to defect. <laughs> And I loved this book so much. I love Abercrombie's female characters. I love his female leads. I love the way he writes companionship and personal growth. People that are... Brand is the sweetest, most wonderful character. I love him on every page that he's on. And Thorne is so tough and gruff and strong and independent. And I love her on every page she's on. I just adore these characters. I love their relationship dynamics. I I loved so much about this book. <laughs> I love this book so much. And then the final one, Half the World, follows a uh, one of the kingdoms that they traveled and visited. We're now following the princess in one of those kingdoms, and now the world is thrown into war, and there's turmoil, and she doesn't know what to do about all that. Plus, also a soldier that in, that's good at war. So it's a trilogy, but they're companions. We have different perspectives, but all the perspectives end up, you know, weaving together and playing essential roles in the end, and I don't know. I like Abercrombie's books. <laughs> like this is not peak Abercrombie. If you are new to Abercrombie and you're looking for a place to start, I would say probably start with some of his more well-known, more commonly talked about series just to kind of see what he's capable of doing. But if you've tried, if you've tried The Blade itself and you found it to be too slow going, and not enough plot so you have bounced off of it maybe give this one a go because this is a lot more tightly paced it's a lot more action-packed it still shows off so much of what Abercrombie can do without showing how far he can take things if that makes sense this is definitely a lesser known series for him it's not one of the series that you know people shout about so much but it was a lot of fun especially book two it was a lot of fun next i read the three body problem which is a sci-fi book this is set in china during the cultural revolution so in the 60s and uh it follows so the the backdrop in the setting is it opens up on a really brutal scene and in some really in high tension scenarios and then from there from that cultural establishing setting sort of thing uh then we have two characters primarily i mean there there's like four perspectives that we follow but we have yi who uh is she watched her father be executed and she's been sent off to a labor camp but then she gets the opportunity to instead participate on some top secret research and then we have wang who is a specialist in a certain scientific field and uh he gets the opportunity to learn more about it but there's a catch and that's that everybody or rather a lot of the people that have looked into this particular field of research before him have ended their lives as they've learned a little bit about it so there's something going on. It's on the back cover, but it doesn't come up until kind of late in the novel. So I don't know how much, I don't know if it's appropriate to say what kind of sci-fi it is or not. But I guess if it's on the back cover, then the secret's out. It's not my fault, right? It's first contact, but not a hopeful, joyful, oh, we're all gonna live in harmony. We're all gonna solve this problem together. It's chilling sometimes oh my gosh but it's also hard science it's a lot of very technical ideas uh theories that are being presented in the way that they have to solve this equation so there's also a video game element that kind of parallels not kind of that does parallel the culture of these other beings that we're potentially making contact with we are i mean we are man this is such a tough one to talk about spoiler free because so much doesn't happen until the second half of the novel but it's definitely a sci-fi with a fascinating plot but it's a sci-fi of ideas it's a sci-fi of what ifs and if then then what <laughs> book one really felt like a ground laying book like we have the setting down we have the characters down we have the establishing okay we just did that now what and I assume book two is going to be the now what I personally loved this book it's a lot of much like blood of a bright haven it's a lot of people talking in rooms 
that's that's the setting it's a lot of people talking in rooms but or re- well the setting is the cultural revolution but you know what i mean but there's still so much tension even though that's true there's so many scenarios that make it so tense like people disobeying direct orders and choosing for humanity <laughs> on behalf of humanity what we're getting into or like get messages being sent to a certain character and only that character and as he tests it and tries to see if other people can see what he's seeing oh gosh i just i don't want to say too much because (laughs) the tension is so there the the tension is so tight even though it's not a high action story Very introspective, very philosophical, very hard science, very interesting. I will be reading book two in October, maybe also book three, (laughs) we'll see. But this, the setting, so because it opens up with the Cultural Revolution, I read the first chapter and then I was like, okay, let me go brush up my history on the Cultural Revolution so that, you know, I'm kind of have the same groundwork as the novel does so I can have whatever kind of conversations it's trying to have. So that had me starting my next book, which is Wild Swans. This is a nonfiction. Um, This is following three generations of women who survived the Cultural Revolution. The first is the grandma of the author of the book. She, I think she was 15 years old when her father gave her away to a warlord as a concubine. And that was rough but she was able to escape with her daughter. And then the communist regime started to come in quietly and uh, her daughter, the author's mom, uh, she was very drawn to the promises that came with it. And she joined up and she met her husband and they had several children. And as the regime rose and as the the (laughs) promises were fulfilled in a very different way than expected, we watched culture change we watched uh from the eyes sometimes of like her father was very regimented and believed in what was believed in mao and mao's philosophies 100 percent, and so he was all in and so we saw it from the eyes of someone who was devoted but questioning in her mom we saw it from someone who was devoted and would never question a thing at least for a long time he didn't from her dad and then we saw it from someone who was raised in it and who was indoctrinated with a lot of things and and she even the author was even a part of the red guard for a short period um (laughs) it's an intense book it's a very intense book and it's brutal naturally at times what she has to recount but it's also extremely informational it's very close-handed accounts of living through this time in history and it was fascinating and the family devotion and getting to see an inside look of what was happening and how it was thought of at the time and how it could have so easily kind of eeped its way in the way that it did. It was all really fascinating. In fact, if you've read any other nonfiction's firsthand accounts of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, I'm interested in reading more. So if you've read any that you would recommend, please do let me know in the comments. Finally, we should talk about The Lies of Locke Lamora. <laughs> I'll be real brief about it, but this is the 10th anniversary edition. I have the all three of them in this edition, and this is what I'm reading on. So I mentioned in on the review channel, I posted a end of the year TBR list of um, books that I plan to read. And in that video, I mentioned that I'm doing a reread of these three books and uh, that I would do, I've already done dedicated reviews for them. Well, at least for the first two. So I'm probably going to do it again, but this time with other booktubers just hanging out and chatting about this series that I love so much. So at the time that I'm filming this, I have not completed my reread of Lies of Luck Lamora, but by the end of the month, it will be done. And by the end of the month, I think we'll have already recorded our discussion for this book and that'll be on the review channel as well so look out for that if you don't already know the lies of lock lamora the gentleman bastard series is my all-time favorite series and has been for a long time i've read through these books too many times they just bring me so much joy and starting this reread again has just been it's it's my happy place it doesn't make sense but it is. Quick pitch, if you haven't heard me talk about it before, think Ocean's Eleven plus Oliver Twist plus phenomenal humor and a character who can't help himself. Locke just can't help himself. He's really clever. 
He has these elaborate ideas and plans that it would be better just stick to simple thieving, boy. That's what he's told at the beginning, and that remains true throughout his life. Just keep it simple, stupid. But he can't, because he's too smart and too stupid at the same time. So he gets into this elaborate heist and, you know, doesn't quite go perfectly. I love these books. I love these characters. I love this humor. I love this world. I, I love the narrative way that they're told. <sighs> they're not perfect, but they do seem to be perfect for me. And for those of you who keep up with my reading really closely and you're curious, I have started the Veiled Throne and Reaper's Gale, but neither one have been finished this month, which is why they're not being talked about in this video. But I did bring them out to the woods just to tell you that I am reading them. I hope you enjoyed this video. It, I didn't get to find Fall in the Trees like I had hoped to. I did find it on the ground plenty, uh, but it was just nice. It was just nice to get out in nature. I hope you enjoyed it. Anyway, that's everything that I read this month. I post videos every Monday and Friday on this channel, Tuesdays and Thursdays on the review channel where I post weekly reading vlogs, dedicated spoiler reviews. If you're into that kind of content, you can check it out. I also buddy read every single book that I read on my Patreon. Check that out if you want to. I'll see you again soon. Bye.